Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the Euler characteristic of a CW complex. This is one of the most fundamental and important invariants of a topological space and it was one of the first topological invariants discovered. This thing shows up absolutely everywhere and I'm going to give you one example of an unexpected place where this Euler characteristic shows up. So let's get to it. So let's discover this invariant sort of naturally. Here are two CW decompositions of the sphere. Uh, let's see how many edges, vertices, and faces this has. Well, in this first one, I see two vertices, the one in the front and the back. And I see four edges, and I also have four faces right over here. Okay, now let's do something a little strange. Let's look at V minus E plus F. Well, that's 2 minus 4 plus 4. I get 2 here. On the right here, I have another CW decomposition of S2. And here, I again have two vertices. I have five edges this time. And I have five faces. And so if I compute this same sum, I'll again get two. Hmm, that seems strange. Now how about we do one more variation on this. Let's see what happens if we chop an edge in half. So what we did in the previous example is we took a uh, the previous decomposition, we sort of chopped the face in half with an edge. Something else you can do is chop an edge in half with a vertex. Well, that is going to add one extra vertex. So I'll now have three vertices, but it also added an edge. So that's six edges and I still have five faces add all of this up with alternating signs, and what you get is two. And if you think about it, if you, if you do any of the subdivision, what happens is you either add a vertex and an edge, but those are gonna cancel out because they, in this count, vertices and edges have opposite signs. Or I'll add an edge and a face, and again they'll cancel out because edges and faces have opposite signs. So it seems like no matter what I do, I end up with this number two. Let's do the same exercise now, maybe on a different topological space. Let's do it on the torus. So I'll look at the torus as a square with the sides identified as usual. So usually we take the uh, boundary of the square to be the CW decomposition, but we don't have to do that. And in this case, I will not be doing that. Let's look at this CW decomposition. I have a single vertex here in the middle. One edge coming out like this and one edge coming out like this. So now there is one vertex there are two edges, the up-down edge and the left-right edge. And how many faces are there? This, this could be a little tricky, but uh, think about it. This face is the same as this face, this face, and this face. So there's really just one face that wraps around the whole torus. If I, for example, go out the top of what looks like to be the top right square, I end up in the bottom right square. Okay, so a single face. Let's add these up. So V minus E plus F, and what I get is zero. Hmm, so it's not the same thing I got when I did it with the sphere. So it's not an invariant of like all surfaces. It, it changes depending on the surface type. 
but let's just make sure we're not getting into trouble here. Let me let me try another decomposition of the torus, maybe one a little more intricate. So let's start with what we had before. Um, and now how about we just put a little square inside of here. So let's count everything up. Vertices. I have four vertices, plain as day. Edges. Uh, let me just put in some, some tick marks for counting them. Here's one edge, two edge, three edge, four edges, five edges, six edges. So six edges. And let's count the number of faces. One face, two faces. Okay, so <laughs> add up the vertices, subtract the edges, add the faces. Vertices plus faces is two minus edges gives me zero. So this seems to be an invariant of the surface type. Let's define it first in general and then prove that it really is an invariant. So here's a definition. Let X be a finite CW complex with a CW structure with C I I cells. We define the Euler characteristic chi of x to be chi of x is equal to the summation as i goes from zero to n of minus one to the i times c i. So in general, uh, so this is the dimension of x. In general, what I do is add up zero cells, subtract one cells, add two cells, subtract three cells, add four cells, and so on and so forth until I get to the dimension of x, and then there's no more cells to add up. So that's the definition in general. Well, here's a natural question. Uh, does this depend on the CW structure. You know, as topologists, we don't necessarily care about a particular CW decomposition. We use them to study the underlying topological spaces. That's what we care about. So I hope this doesn't depend on the CW structure. In fact, in the examples we calculated, it didn't. And that's gonna be our goal, is, is to prove that. So, to do that, we're just going to need a definition and a lemma, and then we can get into the proof. So here's a definition. Let G be equal to Z to the K, direct sum, Z to the D1, direct sum, Z to the Z mod D2, direct sum, all the way up to Z mod DL, be a finitely generated abelian group. We define the rank of G, sometimes I'll abbreviate this as RK of G, to be the integer K above. That is, it's sort of the, the free abelian part of this group. So, so this can be confusing sometimes. Uh, I personally like to think of rank as the minimal number of generators of a group, but that's not the same thing here. We're just talking about the free part, at least for this class. Okay, now here's a lemma. This 
The question is, how does rank behave in a short exact sequence? So let's take a short exact sequence. 0 goes to A, goes to B, goes to C. B, A, short exact sequence of abelian groups. Then the rank of B is equal to the rank of A plus the rank of C. So this, this should be the, the theorem you'd guess, right? Like, you should think of uh, C as roughly being B mod A, and if you had, like, some number of generators in A, and you put them into B, it would, it would chop that off in the uh, quotient, right? So I'm not going to prove this in detail, but the proof idea, I'll say something that maybe... Uh, it doesn't make sense, but uh, there's a notion of a tensor product, uh, which lets you extend uh, basically scalars. So, so I can tensor the sequence with Q. And if you've seen this before, then tensoring with Q basically makes all of the torsion go away. So all that Z mod DL stuff goes away. And then I have a short exact sequence of vector spaces, and then you can use rank nullity. So that, that's the idea of it. If you want to uh, work out the details, you can, but I'll, I'll skip them for now. So now here is our main theorem for today. The Euler characteristic of a space X, so at first this seems to depend on a CW decomposition, is equal to the summation as I goes from zero to N, so this is gonna be the dimension of X, of minus one to the I, times the rank of H I of X. And so the point of this theorem is that the object on the right hand side does not depend on the CW decomposition. So this tells me that the Euler characteristic is really a topological invariant. Great, so let's prove this. Uh, so let's look at uh, the CW or cellular homology chain complex looks like Zero at the very top goes to Cn, Cw of x goes to Cn minus 1, Cw of x, and I'll be calling oops, this one Dn comes down with Dn minus 1 to Cn minus 2 Cw of x, so on and so forth, all the way up to C1 Cw of x down to C0 Cw of x to zero. All right, so that's the thing I use to compute the homology of a CW complex. Now, let Z be equal to the kernel, Zn be the kernel of Dn, and Bn be equal to the image of Dn plus one. These are the groups I use to compute homology. All right, now then we have a short exact sequence of abelian groups, which looks like zero to bi to 
Z I. Uh, of course, sorry. These these ends have nothing to do with the dimension of the CW complex. We should call them I's. All right. So uh, the Ith boundary group maps into the uh, Ith chain group, and then I can take the quotient Z I mod uh, B I to zero. Now you should recognize one of these objects. This here is the i homology group of X, right? Okay, so this is sequence one. Now also, we have another short exact sequence. Which looks like uh, zero goes to Z I and this is just an inclusion into C I C W of X. And then I can map C I C W down by D I to B I minus one, which goes to zero. Now, of course, ZI is the kernel of this DI map, right? So that's why this uh, sequence is exact. So I'll call this two. All right, now by our lemma, this first short exact sequence tells me that the rank of the thing in the middle is equal to the sum of the ranks of the two things on the side. So that is the rank of ZI is equal to the rank of BI plus the rank of HI. That's rank of HI of X, right? And so two implies that the rank of CI, CI, CW of X is equal to the rank of ZI plus the rank of BI minus one. All right, what's that common term that occurs in both of them? It's uh, this rank of ZI. So if I sub one into two, I get that the rank of CI is the rank of BI plus the rank of HI. So this was rank of ZI. And plus the rank of BI minus one. Now, let's go ahead and add this all up. So taking an alternating sum, we get that the summation over i of minus one to the i of rank of ci, let me just write it in, is equal to the summation over i of minus one to the i of all of this stuff. So rank of bi plus rank of hi plus rank of bi minus one. And the point here now, so, so what do I want in the end? Let's just remember, I'm trying to show that the alternating sum of the CIs is equal to the alternating sum of the HIs. So what's getting in the way of this theorem right now, what do we wish was gone, all of those ranks of BIs. And in fact, they do disappear. This is a, like a telescoping sum. Think of each adjacent sum and. So now in each adjacent sum and, or like subsequent sum and, I'll call it adjacent, I hope you know what I mean. 
like in the i in the once term and the, the first term and the second term, or the ith term and the i plus one term. Each uh, adjacent sum n uh, rank of like b i minus one appears with opposite signs. Uh, so all of the rank B I terms cancel with the rank of B I minus one terms in the next sum n. So all those terms go away. And this only goes up to a finite amount of height. You might worry that you'll you'll be limiting to something, but this is a finite CW complex. Uh, so, in the end, uh, we get what we want. The summation as i goes from 0 to n of the rank of the CIs is equal to the summation as i goes from 0 to n of minus 1 to the i, the rank of HI. And um, just let me clarify that all of this should have been in parentheses right here, of course. Great. So the power of this theorem here is that uh, we, got, we got to sort of have our cake and eat it too. You can compute the ranks of the CIs without doing any homology, but you don't know if it's an invariant. And you know homology is invariant, but it involves like taking the quotients and uh, finding the kernels and images of all these maps. So we were able to prove that something that had nice abstract properties, the homology, was equal to something that has nice practical properties, the sum of the number of uh, sum ands, the number of uh, cells, that thing. Okay, so, so let me show you this in action. It's, it's very easy to compute the number of cells in a thing. So here are some quick examples. Uh, the Euler characteristic of sigma g can be computed using this fundamental polygon. So I'm not going to draw it here because we've seen it a few times, but it's got, uh, so sigma g has, so, so maybe the polygon for sigma g has one vertex, two g edges, And one uh, two cell, one face. So the Euler characteristic of the orientable genus G surface is one minus two G plus one. That is two minus two G. That's a formula you should uh, keep near and dear to your heart because it's very useful. Uh, and you can see how quick it was to compute. I just looked at that polygon, was immediately able to read it off. So let's also remember that there are these non-orientable surfaces, which are the connect sum of K RP2s. And here we have that, you could look at the polygon picture there and the other characteristic is two minus K. So the only overlap here is that chi of sigma G is equal to chi of the connect sum of two G RP2s. And so surfaces We've found so many ways to classify surfaces. 
Here's one of the best ones. They're classified by orientability and uh, Euler characteristic. So if you're out in nature and you uh, encounter a surface, it's often like, it really is a great tool to have in your back pocket. It's often easy to calculate the Euler characteristic. And in a lot of cases, you'll know that your surface is orientable for one reason or another. Uh, and so all you have to do is count up some edges and vertices and faces, and you'll know exactly the homeomorphism type of the surface you're looking at. Quite useful. And maybe you can't determine orientability. Well, then you know it's one of two surfaces, and maybe you can do a case-by-case -case analysis there. So I hope I've convinced you that this is uh, pretty useful. Uh, let's do one more. Chi of Sn is equal to, well, how do I build Sn with a CW complex? It's always a single zero cell and a single N cell with the attaching map of the whole boundary of the N cell going to that point. So it's equal to either, either N was odd, in which case I'm supposed to subtract off that N cell, so zero, if n is odd, and two, if n is even. So all these calculations happen super quick, and they give you a nice little invariant of, uh, of uh, CW complexes. So next, I want to show you a way in which the Euler characteristic shows up in some unexpected places. In particular here, it's gonna show up in vector fields. So other characteristics and vector fields. So recall that S2 has no non-vanishing vector field. So we saw this in our uh, talk on degree theory. Uh, but it does have a vector field with two zeros on it. That was this vector field. It has a zero on the top, a zero on the bottom, and then it was sort of this flow just from the top to the bottom. Okay, let's start putting some stuff together. Uh, also, the Euler characteristic of S2 is equal to 2. Strange. Also remember that the odd dimensional spheres have a non-vanishing vector field. We constructed one explicitly. And those have Euler characteristic 0. So what's going on here? Let's gather some more evidence. Uh, so T2 has a non-vanishing vector field. So that looks like, here's our usual picture of the torus. And if I just take the arrows sort of going right all the time, they come out at the other end and they meet up. So everything is nice and continuous. And I can do this the whole way up and down the torus. And if you like this picture better of the torus, it's just the uh, vector field that sort of spins around T2 in this nice circular fashion. 
So this says this is a vector field with no zeros. And the Euler characteristic of T2 is equal to zero. So there seems to be a pattern here which is too consistent to ignore. So let's try to articulate what exactly what's going on. And to do that, we're gonna need a couple definitions and uh, a nice theorem. So let V be a vector field on a, okay, so this is an object we haven't really discussed here, but it's, it's intuitive enough that I think I won't be losing anybody. So it's gonna be on a differentiable manifold. So a manifold is a space that's locally homeomorphic to Rn for some fixed n, and it's differentiable if basically any two uh, local homeomorphisms smoothly differ from each other. So this is just a general space where you can do calculus-like constructions and where vector fields make sense. You've probably seen them at some point in your life. So uh, remember this is like a an assignment. of a point in R n plus one for okay uh, <laughs> this assignment of a, a vector at each point. All right, so uh, now if Z is an isolated zero of the vector field, so it's a zero and there's a little neighborhood with no other zeros, then we can look at a dn neighborhood of z with no other zeros. That's what it means to be isolated. Okay, well, at each point, of boundary dn, We have a vector, we have a n-dimensional vector, that's the correct dimension, uh, which after rescaling, we can consider as a point in s n minus one. So I'm gonna draw some pictures soon and that'll make everything make a little more sense. But the idea is each vector is basically a direction. And if I like, if it's a short vector, I can make it a little longer so that it hits the, uh, the sphere. And if it's a really long vector, I can shrink it down so that it hits a sphere. And that point is unique. It only depends on the direction of the vector. The only vector you can't do this for is the zero vector. Luckily, since we are in the isolated zero case, there are no zero vectors on this little ball here. So I can assign to each point a point in the sphere. So we get a map from boundary dn, which is equal to sn minus one, to S n minus one, and we'll call this map U. Now, what do we like to do with maps between spheres of the same dimension? We like to look at their degree. So let's make a definition here. We define the index at Z of this vector field V 
to be equal to the degree of this map U. All right, so that's all maybe a little too abstract to, to make sense of on the first try, but I'm gonna draw some stuff here and we'll see this is all very nice and concrete. So here is a zero of a vector field and here are a bunch of vectors coming into the zero. So remember the thing that zeros let us do, the reason they're kind of cheating is because you can have a bunch of different vectors, different directions coming in and meeting at a zero vector. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm supposed to do is look at a DN neighborhood of this. So that's D2 and then look at the boundary. So that's uh, an S1 and I'll just add a couple more vectors here. So here is an S1 neighborhood of that zero. And I'm gonna map this over to another S1. And the way this goes is I'm supposed to look at each point. And at each point, there's a vector which has a direction. And I send the point to the point on the, on the sphere which is in that direction. So for example, at this red point here, the vector is pointing straight left. So this red point is gonna go over to that red point. There's also this blue point up here, and that vector is pointing straight down. And so that blue point gets mapped down to the bottom. There's also this green point, which points right, and this purple point, which points up. And so I'm supposed to compute the degree of this map. And well, what is the degree of the map? As I trace around the green circle counterclockwise, I also trace around the black circle counterclockwise exactly once. So it's a one-to-one -one map and it preserves this direction. So the index here is equal to one. And this type of singularity of a vector field is called a source. So the index of a source is always gonna be equal to one. Let's look at the opposite picture here. Here's another vector field with everything pointing outwards. Ah, I'm sorry. This is called a, a sink, right? Everything is sinking in to the vector field. And this here is a source. It's sort of, it's a source of vectors. Okay. And now let's look at this green circle around here. And let's again put in some points, red, blue, green, purple. And what is this map? Well, at the red point, the vector is pointing right. At the blue point, the vector is pointing up. At the green point, it's pointing left. And at the purple point, it's pointing down. In fact, this map is the identity map, uh, if you think about it. And so the index of a source is also one. Let's do one more example. So here is another vector field. It has some directions in which it's sort of pointing away. So it has some source-like behavior, but it also has some sync-like behavior. It's got these directions where it's pointing in and you sort of mesh things up like this. So the, the vectors kind of turn around and uh, make all of this continuous. So this here is called a saddle singularity.
And let's trace around what's going on here. So again, I'll keep track of some points to help me uh, help me anchor what's going on. So this is going to map over. This is that U map. And at the red point, it maps all the way to the left. At the blue point, it maps up. At the green point, it maps right. And at the purple point, it maps down. And so as I go around this green circle counterclockwise, I trace around the black circle clockwise. So it's reversed orientation. And therefore, the index here is minus 1. All right, so let's start putting things together. The Euler characteristic of S2 seems to be equal to the sum over i of the indices of all of the zeros of this vector field for v, the vector field here. So I had two zeros at the top and the bottom. And at the top, I had a source. And at the bottom, I had a sink. Both of those are index one. So one plus one is two. That also happens to be the Euler characteristic. Is this a coincidence? No, it's not, of course. And here is the theorem that quantifies this. It's very important. And it's called the Poincaré Hopf index theorem. So let x be a differentiable manifold. And let v be a vector field on x with isolated zeros. then the Euler characteristic of x is equal to the summation over i of, uh, yeah, so these isolated zeros, or I'm going to call them zi, uh, and the Euler characteristic is the sum over i of the indices of this vector field, regardless of the vector field. So, this is an absolutely amazing theorem. You have this Euler characteristic, which is this combinatorial thing. I just add together some dots and lines and faces and stuff. And it's telling me some deep results about vector fields, which are these continuous objects. Anytime you have a theorem linking the discrete and the continuous, it's a big deal. And this one is no exception. So here's, for example, the, the most baseline corollary you can have from there. If the Euler characteristic has absolute value equal to n, then any vector field has at least n zeros. So uh, for example, this generalizes that Harry Ball theorem, the Euler characteristic of the sphere is two, which tells me that any vector field needs to have at least two zeros, which is in fact even more information than the Harry Ball theorem. We just knew we couldn't have no zeros. We also know now that there's no vector field with a single zero. Great, so uh, the proof of this is a little bit beyond the course, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how fundamental this quantity is. So that's going to do it for today. I um, Some fun exercise you can do after watching this class is try to uh, draw some vector fields on surfaces with the minimal amount of zeros 
given the uh, the Poincaré Hopf index theorem restraints. Thanks, and I'll see you again next time.